Hey Mike here, co-founder of Kumo MTA. I'm going to walk you through the quick start tutorial, show you how to install and set up an instance of Kumo MTA with a basic configuration that is allowed to relay messages from localhost. So the quick start tutorial, as you can see here, is located at docs.kumomta.com slash tutorial slash quick start. I'm going to move that off and we're going to get started. So what I have here is a pre-installed VM that I set up specifically with Rocky Linux 9. We have 16 gigs of memory, four cores. We have 300 gigs of storage space. This is set to the default, so most of this is just winding up in slash home. Doesn't really matter for today's purposes. We're, we're not looking to fill the disks up. We would normally allocate this differently, but we're focusing today on just how to get the install started, okay? So taking the instructions that we have from the, uh, from the article, I'm just going to grab the commands to do a system update. Run those here. We'll let that run. We're going to fast forward. I'll come back at the end of the video, at the end of the install. All right, so what you can see here is that there was a failure to stop the Postfix service simply because it wasn't installed. Again, this is a very minimal install. In fact, we're going to wind up having to update or install a couple of different utilities just to be able to finish the tutorial. So next up though, we've done the installation. So we're going to now do the installation of Kumo MTA itself. So with that, we're looking to get DNF working. We're going to have it reach into the repository that we have set up for at openrepo.kumomta.com to give us the Kumo MTA repo. And then we're going to install Kumo MTA from there. The final command you see here, it can also be used by saying sudo yum install Kumo MTA hyphen dev. If you use hyphen dev, you're going to receive a developer release. The developer release is regularly rebuilt using our CI CD on every commit that we make to the main branch. So if you want the latest and greatest changes and some of our work in progress, you can go with that. It would only be really recommended for testing purposes and for, for environments where you're looking to see if one of our fixes has been able to, to take effect. Dash dev right now, we do make sure to, to test internally before we push to main. So you do have a good chance of this being fairly reliable, but again, not necessarily for production environments, just for pragmatic reasons. Okay, so from there, we're saying, yes, we trust the fingerprints. In it comes. We want to install that package now. Very short, very straightforward process. Okay. From there, just check and see if it's running right now. All right, so that is currently not running. It is loaded. It is available. So we are going to run the following two commands that are seen after we take a look at the config file. So first let's go up Kumo MTA. In this directory, you're going to see three different spots, Etsy for configs, SBIN for our executables, share for some of the available utilities. Okay. So looking in share, what we're going to see is that we have in here a default initial config that you can use in addition to a bounce classifier rule file directory as well as where we keep our policy extras. So looking further in, what we keep in here are some of the helpers that we make available. So because configuration is done using Lua, it can be very flexible, but at the same time, it adds a certain level of complexity. And so we were able to create the helpers as a way to maintain that high degree of flexibility within Kumo MTA while making it easier for those who want to man edit just a basic configuration file to still be able to do that. So I'll show you a couple of examples of what goes on in here. Okay, so we're going to go over here. Let's look at the policy extras. Let's look at shaping.toml. This is a community maintained configuration file that is used to set up traffic shaping. And what you'll notice in it is that it gives you just the ability to set a domain, set your rules for traffic shaping, how many connections, how many deliveries, how fast do we send messages out? How long do we want to wait in timeouts? All of that's in there. And it gives you examples of how you can set this up on a per destination domain basis. So for example, we have Google uh, Gmail's in here, how many deliveries per connection, how many connections to make, do we require TLS? Uh, how many connection failures can we have before we delay 
trying again. Wherever you see a link is where we have been able to go to that mailbox provider's information page and bring that information in in order to add it to the configuration. Ideally, in this file, we're looking for things that have been documented or reliably agreed upon by our community in order to bring them into the, into the file. We do expect this file to grow over time. This would be used in combination with shaping.lua, which is there to, to do that automation, that introduction of the use of the configuration file. You have the ability to not only use the TOML file, all of these helpers are also able to take JSON as a format so that you can more easily update them in an automated fashion. We won't be using any of that today. So let's look at one more file. We're going to go to um, share and we're going to go to minimal. So minimal is simply there to provide enough information to get the server started. So what are you going to see here? You're going to see very simply how this is laid out. We have a, a local include or a require, I should say in this case, that brings in Kumo as, a, as an object. From there, we have an event that fires. That event is called the init event. It runs once when the server starts. Within there, we're passing it back a function. Okay, that function has all of the things that we want to act on as part of setting up the initial server in it. So at the bare minimum, we need the SMTP listener. You'll see it's there. It's listening on every IP on port 25 that is local to the server, has the HTTP listener that is listening again, localhost on port 8000. Both of these by default only allow connection and relay from the loopback, so from localhost itself. So it's, it's secure even by default because it won't accept traffic from any external host whatsoever. In upcoming videos, we will show you how to further set up the configuration and, and get it into a state where it can be used as a relay server. We're defining the spool. So in this case, spool always comes with two different definitions. One is for data, one is for meta. And what those do is data contains the entire message as it was injected after we've done any manipulations to it, including headers and body. Okay, Meta is a separate store specifically for the metadata associated with each message. Because we're much more likely to access and manipulate and work with metadata than message data, this can make things a lot more efficient because we don't have to necessarily touch the file system with the message bodies, except during injection and during delivery, but during requeuing and all of that, we can just work with the metadata. From there, we're also configuring local logs. These local logs are set by default to var log kumo MTA, while the spools were at var spool kumo MTA. Our logs are compressed by default. And as such, they are only streaming and are only synced to disk during startup shutdown and, and certain other events, as well as if the message log reaches a certain size or a certain interval of time has passed. We'll talk later about how we interact with the logs in light of that. But to begin with, that's all we need for the configuration of a server. Very simple config file to begin with. So I'm going to take the next set of commands. This is step five, if you're following along. We're just setting up system CTL to start and enable Kumo MTA, which is just going to make sure that it can then run during any restarts, during any, any other kind of operations that occur that require us to start the server back up. By being enabled, it's part of the auto start. We can also run it manually. You'll see that in the documentation. And so that gives us the ability to test. If we, for example, have issues with startup, if it's not running, we can look to running the software manually in interactive mode that will show us any of those error messages that are occurring in real time so that we can work on that. All right, but that being said, let's give it a quick test. We do not have Telnet installed because it is not part of a default installation in minimal. So we're just gonna fire that up really quickly. That brings in Telnet. Going to the loop back saying port 25, you'll see here connection refused. That's because first it tries to connect over IPv6 and then it tries to connect over IPv4. So with that, we are connected. So we'll start with a hello command. Actually, we'll do an EHLO. Get back what commands are available, what options we can use. We're going to say mail from. We get an okay. Thank you. 
he is connect is accepted as well. I'm going to issue the data command. So it says, all right, send us the body of the message and with a dot on a new line. So for that, we start with headers. The bare minimum is to at least have a subject header. And then we need a blank line between the headers and the body of the message. In my case, I'm doing this from a home machine. I am on a cable provider network that is not going to allow port 25 to leave the network. So this message won't actually successfully deliver, but it will queue up. We will be able to see that information in the logs. All right, we're getting back the idea of the message. This is used as, as part of being able to manipulate messages in the server. It's part of the logs. You can use it to reference the message itself as part of logging. It, becomes part of our headers as well for, for message ID. So from there, we've injected a message. We've queued it up. Let's take a look at the logs. So bar log cool MTA, what we're going to see in here, like I said, the file size is zero. And the reason why the file size is zero is because it has not yet synced to disk because the size is not sufficient. We haven't done a shutdown. We haven't exceeded the period of time necessary. For all those reasons, it's not there yet. So simplest thing we're going to do in this case, go to system CTL, restart of Kumo MTA. With that, we'll give it a minute. It's taking care of some housekeeping. It's making sure that that log is synced. It's making sure that messages are synced from the spool. This does take a little bit of time, especially I find on the first restart that after a while, but once it comes back, that message will be synced out. Obviously a server that is operating with more messages in spool, more logs to, to swap out is going to take longer to go through the restart process. This is why we've designed Kumo MTA to the degree possible to allow you to do things like configuration changes without necessarily having to restart the server. So because of the way we've architected it, restarts aren't as necessary as you would think. In addition, we do have a tailor function that can read those logs in real time as the server is operating if you want to do monitoring that way. So for example, if you are trying to watch the server in real time and a restart doesn't come through, you don't want to have to do a restart to see the logs, you can use the tailor function. I'll show you that in a minute. While we're waiting for that restart to occur, I'm actually going to duplicate the session. Okay. All right, so there's another one. I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna to go to slash op slash MTA slash sbin, okay? Within there, we have KCLI, which is our command line client. We have KumoD, which is the server itself, a proxy that you can use if you're using multiple IPs across multiple servers to, to essentially act as a SOX5 proxy to share those IPs out. You'll also see our tailor function, which is again for monitoring the logs, traffic gen, which is used to generate test traffic for, for performance testing. And you'll see the TSA daemon, which is used for traffic shaping automation. The last one there, validate shaping, is for when you're doing those traffic shaping rules and you want to check and make sure that they're working correctly before they get applied into the server for running as traffic shaping, you're able to use that function. But let's go here again. So now we look in the directory and what do we see? Now there is a file size there. This has been synced and swapped out to disk. Like I mentioned, all of this is being done using ZSTD as a compression protocol. So we are going to require ZSTD in order to be able to view the file. It, the ability to write it in a compressed format is already built into Kumo MTA. So ZSTD to that. That gives us a function called ZSTD cat. That function can then be used with the log file, which is 2023, 1004, 2016, being the timestamp of when this file was originally created. So we're gonna go cool two, three, let it auto complete. And what you'll see after that is a JSON format that is used for our logs by default. You do have the ability to customize the log format. And so we've had a reception come in. There's the message ID, the sender from the mail from, the recipient from the RCPT2. We can see that it was queued into a queue destined for mykillier.com. 
size of 381 bytes, not particularly large, obviously. We got a 250 OK, so we did receive it. We did give back an OK. We don't have any enhanced codes or anything. This server will do advanced analysis of bounces, perm fails, temp fails. But for a simple 250 OK, obviously, none of that gets filled in. From there, we see where is this going? The peer was mykillier.com because that's what I gave as the EHLO. The address of that node was 127001. If you're getting injections from the outside world or from your dedicated injectors, this is where you see what was their e-hello, what was their IP address, what was the timestamp of this, how many attempts have we made so far? We see so far zero. We haven't attempted to deliver it. It hasn't bounced yet, so the bounce classification will be blank. It'll be set to uncategorized. We see that there's no egress pool, there's no egress source. This is the IP and the pool that it belongs to that were used for the delivery attempt or successful delivery. We haven't done that yet, so these again are set to null. We have one format for the most part, regardless of what type of event occurs, which is why you're going to see the nulls and the empty values in some of these fields. It was not a feedback loop, so the feedback report is also null. I added no metadata, I added no custom headers, so none of that is present. And then we didn't deliver it, so it doesn't have a deliverability protocol. The reception protocol is how we got it in, that was ESMTP, and this is the identity of the node, in this case, that, that received that message. So that's the full information there as far as, as what happened to that message. That, in a nutshell, is the quick start tutorial. We have a server now that can send out basic mail. If you were, for example, just setting up a web server and you wanted it to be able to, to attempt to relay through localhost, and it wasn't built on like a, a built-in SendGrid or PostFix integration, if it was just talking SMTP to a local, a local instance, that would be enough. As you saw, we used some pretty pretty heavy duty specs as far as a basic server is concerned. So this does have four cores, 16 gigs of RAM, 300 gigs of storage. Not really necessary if you're only sending a few messages at a time, but we're trying to target more like a million messages an hour in the examples that we do as part of the tutorial. So in our next video, we will go into more in depth into how to set up your operating system, how to prepare it for being used in, in a product, more production MTA environment, and how to do a, a more more delayed install, the more complex install. We'll see you on the next video. Hopefully this is of use.